Welcome to Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby. I'm your host, Amber Sitton. What is done in darkness will eventually come to light. That is the purpose of this podcast, to shine light on the disappearance of Jessica Hamby. Listener discretion is advised. The subject matter may involve violence, sexual content, murder, and adult themes. This episode does contain foul language. It is not suitable for younger listeners. This is Episode 8 of Season 3 of a serialized podcast, and the episodes are designed to be listened to in order. Jessica Leanne Hamby has been missing since January 3rd, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, the 24-year-old mother of three was a beautiful brunette with big hazel eyes. She had a head full of long, thick hair, was 5 foot 2 inches tall, and weighed approximately 125 pounds. In the four and a half years since Jessica was last reported to be seen, the stories regarding her disappearance and fate have been plentiful, and the facts scarce. We are starting from the beginning, and by the beginning, we are beginning with Jessica's life six months prior to her disappearance, as we bring you the findings of our investigation in real time. In this episode, you are going to hear a lot from a woman named Mary. This isn't the first time you've heard from her, but her contributions in previous episodes have been relatively small. When we previously introduced her, we described her as a friend of Jessica's. That description seemed to upset a few people because there have been several rumors regarding Mary related to both Jessica and Jeremy. I'm using the word rumor because at this time, we can't substantiate the claims. However, we did discuss these topics with her during our numerous interviews, and you'll be hearing that a little later. We were astounded at the outrage that came from us calling Mary Jessica's friend. To clarify, we think that whatever happened to Jessica Hamby, it involved people she knew, trusted, and most likely considered to be her friends, at least at some point. The same applies to Jeremy Abbott. We believe whatever happened to Jeremy was done by friends and likely even his own family. Unfortunately, people are often murdered by those they know and love, and whether they are called mother, father, sister, husband, or friend doesn't change that. When we work a case, we talk to as many people associated with the victims as possible, and Mary was no exception to that. We can't get answers without asking questions. Not speaking specifically about Mary or anyone else, we know that not everyone we speak to is truthful with us. But truthful or not, the information is still important because sometimes the lies are just as revealing as the truth. I feel like it's a bit ridiculous we are having to point out what I think is obvious to the overwhelming majority of you. We often present you with what people have told us. Sometimes that's through you listening to the recorded audio of our interviews. Sometimes it's from us repeating the statements individuals have given to us or others in interviews. It simply means you are hearing exactly what they told us. It doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's false. It doesn't mean we believe it or that we don't believe it. We clearly state when we are able to verify statements as fact. We also clearly state when we are able to verify statements as false. The rest is there for you to use your own discernment to form your own thoughts, opinions, and theories. We asked Mary how she and Jessica first met. 
there was two young men staying at my house, Zach Grommer and a guy named Worm. His name was Anthony Nate, I think was his last name. And one of them would meet a girl and they would bring her over. And, you know, Zach's originally the one that brought Jess to my house. And when he brought her over, I just fell in love with her. She was a drug addict like me, but she had the sweetest soul. Do you remember when that was? Sometime in 2017. It's the best I can tell you. Is I've only been sober about two years now. And my memory still kind of, some of it's fuzzy as far as dates and stuff goes. I want to say it was like towards the beginning of 2017, like February, March, something like that. Y'all were good friends, weren't you? I absolutely love Jessica to pieces. We shared the same birthday. And that's I think that's one of the reasons why we got so close is because I had never met anybody that had the same birthday as me. And, you know, like I told you before, Mr. Mike, you know, I had, had a bad heroin addiction. And the so-called friends that I had, they weren't friends. I remember Jess when she found out I was doing heroin, sitting on the end of my bed and crying with these great big tears and just, Mary, please, you can't do that. It's going to kill you. I love you. I don't want nothing to happen to you. You know, and just so adamant about it. And she had such a good soul and she just, she stole my heart. She really did. Mary shared some of her favorite memories about Jessica with us. Yeah, she showed up at my house. It was like 4 5 o'clock in the morning. And she climbed in through my bedroom window and climbed up in the bed with me. Scared the living bejesus out of me. I screamed and all she could do was just laugh. It's Jess. It's Jess. So I throw on my light and <laughs> sure enough, it was Jess had crawled up in the bed beside me. And after that, you know, we would joke about, I'd tell her, what are you going to do, break in my bedroom window again? She said, yeah, I just might. And I'd tell her, well, I'm just going to screw, I'm just going to nail it down. And she would come back, well, I know how to use a screwdriver. Mary told us that Jessica and many others would show up at her home when they were hungry or tired or just needed a place to sleep. She told us sometimes she wouldn't hear from Jessica for a couple months, and then she'd pop back up. And at some point, um, you had told me your power got turned off, and you moved into a motel Mm -hmm. for a little while. Uh, Right about Christmas time, about two weeks before Christmas, my power had gotten turned off, and I went and stayed up at the Haleville Motel. And it was Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, I do believe. And Jess had come up there with me, so I wasn't by myself. And she stayed with you how long? I want to say to the day after Christmas. And then a friend of mine that lived right next door to me come and got us. And instead of going back to my house, we went to their house because the money I'd had had run up. And if you know anything about the Haleville Motel, it's very expensive and very not worth it. (laughs) Okay. So when y'all left the motel, you It's a drug den. I mean, yeah, we worked to the trailer right beside my trailer on Kid Run because, you know, my power was still cut off and it was really cold and they didn't want us over there. The original plan was to go back to my trailer and it was going to be after the first of the year before the power company could get out to get my power cut back on. And they didn't want us over there because it was, you know, dark and it was cold. And we were two females by ourselves. So they said that, you know, we were more than welcome to stay over there with them as long as we wanted to. I actually lived with them for a little while. So y'all went there and did Jessica stay there with you another night? No, it wasn't cloud night. She uh, stayed there with me for several hours. And then she had asked if she could use my phone. And I told her, sure. So I gave her my phone, and uh, she was talking to somebody. And she left. And she was gone all night, and then all the next day, up into later that night. And then she come back and was bringing my phone back, and that's when she told me that she was going into the detox at Lakeland Community. She said that she was in the car with her aunt. And she brought you your phone back, and then she, as far as you know, she went to the detox. 
as far as I know of, she went to the detox. She got, um, she brought my phone back and she actually borrowed my red Alabama hoodie. Okay. Cause it was cold. It was really cold. Yeah, it was cold. It was cold. And Jess had a, for some reason, I guess she stayed a lot colder. I'm hot natured and she was not. She would freeze. And she had asked if she could use my red hoodie going to the detox. And naturally, I told her, of course, you know, I'd give the girl the shirt off my back had she asked for it. Do you remember what she was wearing? I want to say she had on blue jeans and a T-shirt and tennis shoes or maybe leggings and a, you know, I know she had on some kind of pants. Michael and I have always believed that what was going on in Jessica's life in the months and especially the weeks prior to her disappearance could be important to finding out what happened to Jessica. We've put a lot of focus on interviewing people who spent time with her in that time frame. As we've mentioned before, it has been oddly difficult to establish even the most basic facts, and sometimes we receive contradictory accounts. This is one of those times. Sometimes the conflicting stories might be an indication that someone is providing intentionally misleading or inaccurate information. Sometimes the differences in the accounts are different simply because we are asking people to remember details of events that happened four and a half years ago. Variations of stories and conflicting information does not necessarily mean that someone is lying. We try to determine the reason stories vary, but sometimes we just aren't able to determine that answer with certainty. This part of Mary's story is in direct conflict with two other interviews we conducted. In episode four, we told you about interviewing the woman who gave Jessica a ride to the detox on the night of December 28th. We gave this woman, who Jessica often referred to as her aunt, the fictitious name of Jane. Jane is an older woman, and she was, and still is, uninvolved in the lifestyle Jessica was living. She'd known Jessica for several years, and they'd become close. She tried to help Jessica whenever she could. She often gave her rides, and she sometimes allowed Jessica to borrow her vehicle, the Mercedes-Benz that Travis Jackson referred to in his communications with Jessica. We aren't going to repeat everything Jane told us but we do want to note the conflicts between Jane's account of the night Jessica went to detox and Mary's account of that night. Jane told us that when she picked Jessica up on the street near a residence that Jessica had been at that day, Jessica initially asked Jane to take her by another home on the way to the detox facility because she needed to pick up her clothes that she'd left there. Jane told us that she refused Jessica's request to make that detour because she'd been trying to convince Jessica for quite some time to go into the detox facility. She said she was afraid that if she made a pit stop, Jessica would change her mind about going to detox. While Jane insisted Jessica go directly to Journey, as soon as she dropped Jessica off, She went to the home where Jessica's clothes were to pick them up for her. Jane was able to describe the exact home she went to that night to pick up Jessica's clothing, and once she had them, she told us she drove them directly back to leave for Jessica at the detox facility. We spoke to Jane prior to our interviews with Mary, and after we heard the conflicts in Mary and Jane's recollections, we asked Jane about it again. We asked her if it was possible that she had taken Jessica with her when she went to pick up her clothing. Jane was adamant that she took Jessica straight to the detox and she went to pick up Jessica's clothes alone. We asked her if she had taken Jessica to return a borrowed phone to someone. Again, Jane was adamant that she did not take Jessica anywhere other than directly to Journey Detox and she did not remember Jessica having a phone that belonged to someone else. You'll hear about the second conflict with this part of Mary's account. 
a little bit later in this episode. And did you hear from her after she went into detox? Did you hear from her again? I wish I had. So she didn't try to message you the night that she went missing? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Which, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. If she was trying to find a ride somewhere, I don't see why she wouldn't have messaged me because she knows I would have done my best to find a ride to do what she needed to do. I wish she would have messaged me. She may still be here with us. So you say that she didn't contact you at all while she was in the detox facility and she didn't contact you when she got out, correct? Right. She sent a message to Jamie. Do you know Jamie? Mm -hmm. I do. Who was he? A play toy that I had at the time. Okay. That's the best way I can put it. Um, Just one of the little guys that I was messing around with around about the time she went into detox. He had been up at the motel with me. I want to say it was Christmas Eve. He was up there with me. He was there when Jess first come up to the motel where I was at. Yeah, she sent Jamie a message and said, you around Mary, but he didn't answer. Till the yeah, night. Mr. Mom told me about that. I, you know, that's the first I'd heard of that. Jamie never told me that Jess was trying to get in touch with me. I don't know why she wouldn't have texted me on mine unless my phone was out of minutes or... She wasn't able to, you know, which, you know, it's a possibility because, you know, my phone did run out of minutes quite a bit. And, you know, it could have been that I was offline or that, you know, I didn't have minutes and she knew that he had been around and trying to get in touch with me. But by the time she went into detox, I done got bored with that dude and wasn't talking to him. Jessica sent Jamie the message asking him if he was around Mary on January 3rd at 1.33 a.m. Jamie did answer Jessica, but not until January 4th, well after Jessica disappeared. We've always thought it was odd that she messaged him looking for Mary, but according to her Facebook records and her phone records, Jessica never tried to call or message Mary directly. After Mary's appearance in one of the past podcast episodes, she was confronted by a couple people in an online Facebook group for Jessica Hamby. Most of the things she was publicly accused of were things we'd already discussed with her in interviews that she'd consented for us to record for use in this podcast. After this online confrontation, we did interview her again because she wanted to specifically address those public accusations. We've conducted three lengthy interviews with her, and we will say that Mary has been one of the more cooperative and willing to help of all those we've interviewed, and she has filled in a lot of gaps about Jessica's life before she went to detox and we've been able to confirm the truthfulness of much of it. And brought up the fact that your podcast had a girl on it. Now, she did not call me by name, but everybody that listens to the podcast, they know who I am. You know, and she brought up that there was a girl on the podcast two weeks prior to Jeremy's airing, and that uh, this girl was on there talking like she was somebody, and that In all reality, she basically said that I knew more about Jessica's disappearance than what I'm letting on and that y'all are looking in the wrong direction. I've never been questioned about Jessica's disappearance. Never. Y'all are the first ones that's talked to me about her her disappearance. There was no possible way for me to have had anything to do with Jessica's disappearance due to the fact I was in Lincoln County. She uh, changed the subject awful quickly and brought up that she knew for a fact that I had burnt the bottom of Jessica's feet and that I had something to do with it and blah, blah, blah. And I brought it up to her attention. I said, if somebody burnt the bottom of my feet, would you have been in a motel room? It was supposed to have happened before Christmas, way before Christmas, like over the summer. And not too long after Jeremy came up missing is when it was supposed to have happened. And there's a picture of Jessica in the motel room with me in the background laid out across the bed Christmas of 2017. 
Mary was the female whose name we bleeped when we shared the claim that Jessica had been restrained and her feet had been burned in the days or weeks following Jeremy Abbott's disappearance. As far as Jessica's feet being burned, it was not never done in front of me. I don't know for a fact that it was done. I was told that it was done by her mama. But as far as being there when it was done, it was not done in front of me. I did not have anything to do with that. And that's the same thing that I told Lynn three years ago when she came in, came to my house and confronted me about it, which I, you know, I don't blame Lynn at all for that. If I find out that you've done something to hurt my child, I'm going to be up in your face and I'm going to confront you about it too. She was just doing what any normal mother would do. Up until I talked to y'all, I've never been questioned on anything. You know, Lynn did come and ask me about, you know, Jessica's feet getting burned. I've never had any police officers come talk to me. I've never had them ask me anything. So you were you were in the Winston County Jail at that time when Jessica disappeared? Around about that time, yeah. I'm not sure exactly the day I got arrested. I was too high to be normal. But I know I got arrested in January and was sentenced at the end of January to go to prison for a 45-day dunk. They transferred me February the 12th from Winston County Jail to Cutwaller. I done my 45 days and got released April the 26th of 2018. And, you know, I come back home. But it was towards the beginning of the month when I got arrested in January. Which, I mean, that should be public record. I mean... The first time Mary mentioned that she was in jail when Jessica disappeared was in our most recent interview with her. When we attempted to verify that, we learned from the Winston County Jail that they have upgraded their system since 2018. And during that process, they lost all inmate records from the previous system. While the person that Michael spoke with at the jail was familiar with Mary... She couldn't recall specifically if Mary was an inmate in January of 2018. We still have a couple of avenues to pursue to try and confirm when Mary was in jail and hope to provide an update soon. Another thing that was brought to our attention by numerous people was a Facebook post that was made by the man that had been accused, along with Mary, of burning Jessica's feet. So far, we've concealed his name, and we are going to continue to conceal it for this episode. His name is the only name bleeped as you listen to Mary. In this Facebook post, this man called out a woman as being a snitch. The person he named in the post was not Jessica, and the post itself isn't really what's of interest. It's the comments that caught the interest of many, including us. The post was made on August 13th, 2017, so it was after Jeremy's body had been found, but prior to Jessica Hamby's disappearance. Mary commented on the post, and it was something we wanted to ask her about. And then he um, he came on and said, I GMDO, snitch you, got Jessica and Keith, and it appears that he's replying or, you know, talking to you. He didn't hit reply, but you had said just above it, do I need to beat some ass for real? And he says, I giggled my dick off, snitch. You got Jessica and Keith. And I'm assuming that Keith might be Jeremy Abbott because he was Jeremy Keith Abbott and his Facebook was Keith Abbott, I think. Yeah. Um, I know the post you're talking about. I don't remember him saying that. But now I remember the post you're talking about. I was talking to him about, uh, at the time I was hanging out with really close. Him and, um, my husband that passed away, Bruce Sutherland, were really good friends in school. And we were hanging out for him and I'd been buying acid from him. And he was talking about that Tracy girl, which is who I was talking about going to beat ass was that Tracy girl. Now, I don't know what he's talking about. One of the primary reasons we wanted to speak with Mary is because she was one of the last known people to spend time with Jessica prior to her entering Journey Detox. 
You said that Jessica was acting very afraid, like when y'all were in the hotel room. Yeah, she didn't want any. You know, Jamie had been up there with me. And when she got there, she didn't even want him there. She just wanted it to be me and her. And I told him we had to go. And she didn't want anybody coming up. She didn't want anybody knowing she was there. It was like she was was scared somebody was looking for her. In the last few weeks, we received some other new credible information about an event that possibly happened while Jessica was at the motel. So we wanted to ask Mary about that, too. So when Jessica was staying at the hotel, we have some evidence, information, that uh, that while y'all were there at that hotel, that, that Jesse Abbott showed up there with a gun looking for Jessica, yeah. was pacing up and down the hallway outside, I guess, the hotel room door. Outside of our room door? Yes, looking for Jessica. I don't know. I never saw Jesse. I'm not going to say he wasn't, but I never saw him. And I mean, if that be the case, then that would explain why Jessica didn't want anybody in the room with us. The information we have is that she called somebody and they came and got her in the middle of the night after that event. And that that's when she left the hotel. No, Jessica left the hotel with me the 27th or the 28th, something like that. Anyway, it was right after Christmas, and she left with me that morning. We checked out together, and we went to house, which was right beside where my house was on Kid Road. We interviewed another man we will call Amos, and some of the information he shared with us is the second conflict we mentioned with Mary's recollection of events. Amos told us that he received a call from Jessica on December 26, 2017, at around 2.30 or 3 a.m. He said Jessica was very upset and told him that she needed him to come get her from South Haleyville. He picked her up from a home there, not the motel where Mary told us that she and Jessica were until later that morning. He told us that Jessica was upset, hungry, and exhausted. He said he took her to a home in Phil Campbell where she stayed with him and others until Denise picked her up to take her to detox on December 28th. He told me they fed Jessica and afterwards she slept for hours. I asked him what phone Jessica was using. He told me Jessica had her own phone. I asked if she had another phone with her that belonged to someone else, and he said she did not. While Mary said she didn't remember Jesse coming to the motel with a gun looking for Jessica, she did share some important information with us. Michael asked Mary if she knows Josh Levi Hyde. I do know Josh Hyde. I know that uh, Josh Hyde is not a very good person. I also know that there's a lot of, and I have to say rumors because that's not been proven, but there's a lot of rumors and speculation that Josh Hyde had something to do with Jeremy Abbott and his death because Steve Benefield, which is where they found Jeremy, him and Josh Hyde are somehow kin, and he was staying around there about that time. I know Jess was scared of Josh Hyde. I think she may have overheard a conversation that he was having with somebody because the conversation me and her had when something like this, it was, uh, I don't like Josh Hyde. Why don't you like Josh Hyde? I don't like what he was having to say. Well, what did he say? I can't tell you because if I tell you, it can get you in trouble. And that's all she would say about it. Was that? Before or after Jeremy went missing? That was after they had done found Jeremy's body. And, you know, a lot of the rumor is is that, you know, Jess somehow or another led police to where Jeremy's body was located. And, you know, I know something. Jess knew something about Jeremy Abbott. Whether, you know, she would not tell me. I tried. Tried to get her to talk to me about it, and she would not. I do know she knew something about it and that she was troubled about it. It bothered her a whole lot. 
because anytime Jeremy's name would come up and, you know, just pass in conversation with somebody, Jessica would get really upset and she would walk out of the room. And, you know, I would go in there where she was at and she would just have this almost sickening look on her face. Like she just couldn't believe something that she was like, she was thinking something in her head. And she just could not believe that what she was thinking could possibly be true. She would have the most just sickening, like she was sick on her stomach, look on her face. She told you she didn't like Josh Hyde. Did she express that she was afraid of him? She said that she felt like he would be somebody that could hurt her. And my exact words to her was, if he tries to hurt you when I'm around, he'd be the last thing he does. And it it would have been. You know, I, I would have probably gotten myself in a home a lot of trouble. If I'd ever seen anybody trying to physically hurt Jessica with my own eyes, it would have been on like Donkey Kong. I'd, I'd have been putting my hands on somebody. Because Jess was just... Jessica didn't take... You know, if you ever met her, she had a fighting spirit. As in, she was not a quitter. She did not give up. But as far as a physical fight, she, I don't think she liked to physically fight. I don't think she was very confrontational. At least around me, she wasn't. I'll put it like that. Do you know if Jessica ever went to the cemetery where Jeremy was buried? Yeah. I know she went up there several times. Me and her went twice that I know of. And it was not too long after Jeremy was buried. She wanted to go up there and put flowers on his grave. And we went up there and she put flowers on his grave. And when she walked away, she was really upset. You know, she had tears in her eyes. And the next thing out of her mouth was, I need a shot. You know, and if you know anything about drug addicts, if something bothers us and something's hurting us, our way of blocking it out is by getting high. It clouds our memory and it clouds our brain to where we don't have to feel those emotions. And my opinion, and it's just my opinion, Jess knew something about what happened to Jeremy. I don't know if it was because of a conversation she had overheard with somebody or if it was something somebody had told to her. But in my heart, I honestly believe that Jess knew something about Jeremy because she was, Jeremy Abbott was a very touchy subject with her. She would get really, really upset anytime his name was brought up. And I even asked her one time, I said, Jess, do you know anything? And she said, if I did, I would never tell anybody because it would mean the end of my life. And I took that as, you know, as, as someone that's actually sat down and had conversations with her, I took that as if she did know something, she would never repeat it because she was fearful that if she did, something bad would happen to her. So did Jessica spend a lot of time with Jeremy? Uh, on and off. I do know that Jeremy was at my house with Jess for about a week, maybe a little over. Not too long before he come up missing. It had maybe been a month, maybe a month, that he had been out at my trailer with Jess before he come up missing. Remember the messages between Jessica and Marcos that we read to you? We asked Mary what Jessica meant by those messages. Another thing that we talked about before that, if you're comfortable with it, get you to talk about that again. I I read you one of the messages that Jessica sent to Marcos. Yeah, about ask Mary she knows something about it or something similar to that. Yeah, she said, Mary told me who fucking done it. What do I do? Call unknown or what the fuck? Yeah. She's talking about Jeremy. Yep. That goes back to a conversation that me and Jessica had had that uh, I purchased running around on the streets, a friend of mine had gotten a pistol, a 25, and I bought it. You know, it was the cutest little thing. I just don't know why I needed a gun because I really, I wouldn't, I don't think I could have shot anybody, but I just wanted it. And had asked me if it had a mismatch clip, like the clip that comes out of the gun if it was a different color than the gun itself. And I told him I didn't know I hadn't looked. And he said, let me see it. And I told him, okay. 
I let him see it, and uh, he told me that that was the gun that shot Jeremy. And the gun originally, it went from Jesse Abbott, which was Jeremy's cousin, to a guy named and I purchased it from I do know that Jesse had a fit wanting that gun myself because uh, he was up at the motel and he got in touch with me and asked me to come up there. And I went up there and uh, we rode out to Bear Creek to uh, his brother's house. And he was parked on the like this little dirt drive behind his brother's house. He went in. He come back out. We got high and he brought up the fact that um, he knew that I had bought that gun and that he wanted it back and that he was going to get it back no matter what. And it scared me because why would you want it so bad? You know, one of the com- the statements that he made was, you know, you can swing in the tree beside where Jeremy was at. So it kind of, it, it scared me. And shortly after me and Jess were having a conversation and I told her, I said, Jess, I said, something happened. I said, it's bothering me. And she asked me what it was. And I told her exactly like I just told you that um, I, you know, I had bought a gun and that Jesse was really interested in determined that that gun was going to be brought back to him, that I didn't need it. It wasn't supposed to be sold. The guy, he, I guess he pawned it to the guy for some dope and the dude wasn't supposed to sell it, but he did anyways. And I have no idea where that gun's at now. I left it with and I walked away from it. And me and Jess did have a conversation about that. As noted earlier, Mary's name has been included in stories related to both Jeremy and Jessica. Here is something that Kim told us her brother Carrie told her about Mary. You know, it goes back to the story where she told my brother that they had Jeremy in a in a deep freezer. Like, and she was sitting on top of it getting high while he was trying to get out. He wasn't dead at that point. So, you know, I kind of wish, you know, well, from her thing, he wasn't dead at that point because she, unless she was just trying to upset my brother. I mean, I'm not really sure, you know, a lot of people do things like that. But, you know, she said she was on the freeze, deep freeze, getting high, her and her boyfriend getting high on the deep freeze. And Jeremy was trying to kick the lid open or kick the lid, get it open, and, and they were sitting on it so he couldn't get out. According to Kim, Carrie told her this deep freeze was located on Josh Hyde's grandfather's porch. There have been a couple variations to the rumor as far as who Mary was allegedly mad at, and we asked her about it during one of our earlier interviews. One of the rumors that I think we've probably heard more than once is there are some that say that you were involved with what happened to Jeremy and what they talk about to support that um, is that you got mad at Jesse Abbott and you took a picture of yourself either in or beside the freezer that supposedly Jeremy's body was in. That's a new one on me. That's a real big new one on me. That's one I'd never heard. I know I was never questioned about Jeremy by any of the cops or by anybody, for that matter. Have I ever been questioned about Jeremy? And if they wanted to, they're more than welcome to. They could hook me up to a polygraph. I have no problem with that. And and tell them the same thing. I have no clue what happened to Jeremy. I know what the rumors are around town. But as far as knowing, no. And as far as getting mad with Jesse Abbott, Jesse Abbott can make Jesus Christ himself mad at him. I mean, I just, (laughs) that's a new one on me. I'm shocked on that one.
Regardless of whether the rumor about Mary and the freezer is true or not, there have been so many accounts and rumors regarding Jeremy being kept in a freezer. In episode 6, we expressed our doubt that a body left outside in the June and July Alabama heat and humidity would still have the strong stench that was described to us by law enforcement on the scene that day, and also by Jeremy's mom, Kim. Kim and many medical and forensic experts that we've consulted have been skeptical that Jeremy would have still been hanging in that tree for the time frame that law enforcement claimed he was. We have reasons to believe there's some truth to the rumors about Jeremy being kept in a freezer, and that would certainly explain the condition that his remains have been described to be in. There are so many unanswered questions about Jeremy's death. Questions and circumstances that would have come to light had there been any investigation at all into the case. As we've shown, though, Jeremy's death was brushed off before his body even left Benefield Farm Road, and more than likely, even before he was removed from the tree. It is certainly within the coroner's power and his duty under law to make a ruling as to the cause and manner of death as quickly as possible when the circumstances and evidence are clear. In Jeremy's case, they were anything but clear. With Jeremy, we believe it was the coroner's duty to insist on an investigation, including having the Department of Forensic Sciences conduct an autopsy. It's entirely possible however unlikely in our opinion, that the result may have come back the same and Jeremy's death might have been ruled a suicide by hanging. The difference is, there would have been legitimate facts about his death on the record, facts that would answer the family's questions and it could be challenged in peer review by other experts. Jeremy and his family weren't just denied justice they were denied the very opportunity to obtain justice. We've been told that one of the first responders present when Jeremy's body was removed from the tree made a comment to the effect that there's one less doper to deal with. Unfortunately, that's a sentiment that we've heard far too often. Many victims' family members have told us that is the reason their loved one's cases haven't been solved. There are facts about Jeremy's case that make us believe there is more to why his case was closed, and there is so little documentation. We believe those reasons go beyond mere ineptitude or negligence. Jeremy's mom, Kim, has also now made a formal request to the district attorney in Marion County that her son's case be reopened and that his body be exhumed for the autopsy he and his loved ones were wrongfully denied. As Jeremy and Jessica's families await official word on their request, we will remain hopeful that in light of the evidence we've discussed here, they will make the only right decision. Jessica was deeply troubled by what happened to Jeremy. She was scared for her own safety, but she showed a mother's empathy for what Kim was going through and did the right thing. She didn't snitch on anyone. She just gave enough information to find him. To us, that Jeremy was missing all those weeks and was ultimately found through Jessica's tip should have been enough circumstantial reason to look harder at his death. But nobody did that, and they just let Jessica out of jail, making her a target. Jessica felt that she had to leave the state for her personal safety after that. And less than six months later, Jessica, too, was missing. Any reasonable person would likely conclude that this is highly suspicious These were the events that ultimately led Jessica to the North Fork area of Marion County the night of January 2nd, 2018, and put her in the company of Alicia and Derek Motes, Eric Edwards, Shane Reynolds, Gilbert Shaw, 
and for at least some period of time, the Edwards residence on Elgin Cochran Road. But that's not where the link between Jeremy's death and Jessica's disappearance ends. In the next episode, you'll hear some startling connections that may indicate that Jessica's destination and the group of people she was with that night was anything but random. In fact, you may start believing that the lack of progress finding Jessica is part of something much, much bigger. Join us next time as we further explore what happened to both Jessica Hamby and Jeremy Abbott, and as we continue to investigate and push for justice for them both. If you have any information that could help solve the disappearance of Jessica Hamby or the murder of Jeremy Abbott, please email me at secretstruecrime at gmail.com or call our confidential tip line at 205 282 07 Four zero. Michael and I will ensure that all information gets to the right place right away. If you are left still wanting even more content, please check us out on Patreon. We have filled it with great information about Susan and Evan, Eric and Gypsy, and we will be adding additional content about Jessica and Jeremy. This podcast is an independent podcast. That means that everything that goes into making this podcast is done and funded by me. All of the investigative tools and resources are provided by Echo 7 Foxtrot. The tragedies we highlight and investigate have had a tremendous impact on the victims, loved ones, and friends. We don't burden them with additional expenses to cover their cases. We donate our time and talents because we want to help and hope to find the answers that are so long overdue. For as little as $5 per month, you can receive exclusive access to members-only photos, videos, early access to episodes, and much, much more. By becoming a patron, you too are helping us help these families. Patreon.com slash Secrets Crime. I'll also post the link on our Facebook page. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to follow or subscribe in your podcast player of choice and by giving us a five-star rating and review. We are active on social media and will often share photos of Jessica and Jeremy. Follow Secrets True Crime on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secrets Crime. This episode was co-written by me and Michael Fleming. The audio production for this podcast is by Kane Power at precisionpodcasting.com.